I'm Alec Abdukov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. I do not think I can stress enough to you how grateful I am that you all are listening to this little podcast of mine. It was just a year ago when I was looking at download statistics, and I was so happy when I saw I had three whole downloads that day. Just a few days ago, I got over 50 downloads. Also, here's one last incentive to go to follow my Twitter. My third favorite podcaster of all time, Zach Twomley, gave a shout out to my podcast on his Twitter. So be sure to listen to his podcast, When Diplomacy Fails. The link to that is in the episode description. Seriously, that was one of the highlights of the past week for me. So thank you, Mr. Twomley. Another thing is to remember that I am challenging you all to go on listener support because any donations from now until the end of July will be going straight to help the Ukrainians. And finally, be sure to give me honest feedback and reviews from wherever you listen. It genuinely means a lot whenever I hear from you all. Now, on to the road of war. King Frederick paved this road with his decisions in the last episode. The main catalyst for the war was Frederick's surprise invasion of Silesia in December of 1740. He was taking advantage of Austrian weakness after the death of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI. Frederick could also invade because the major allies of Austria, Britain, and Russia were either distracted by war or internal conflicts. I have also decided that I will do an episode about the War of Jenkins' Ear. I just think it's too much of a crazy story to not tell. After all, it was during the times of Frederick the Great, even though it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the actual life of Frederick the Great. Anyway, I talked a little bit about Frederick's winter campaign of 1740 in the last episode. The last thing I discussed was the storming of the fortress of Glogau on the Oder by the son of the old Dessauer. The main structure of this episode will be to first look at the campaign of Frederick's army in the spring of 1741, and then go to the moment, one might say a culmination point, of all the years the Prussian army trained under Frederick Wilhelm. This will be the main test of young King Frederick as a military commander. It's in the title of today's episode. Today's main topic will be the first major battle of Frederick's life, the Battle of Molwitz. Here's a small bit of news from Austria that arrived in Frederick's camp a few days after the successful storming of Glogau. Maria Theresa had given birth to the future Joseph II on March 13, 1741. Side note, I decided to check whether that date would have been a Friday the 13th situation, but Joseph's birth was on a Sunday, so it's all good. Anyway, Joseph II would be another enlightened absolutist monarch in Europe as Frederick was on the throne. This means that Joseph was a man who believed in positive reform for his people, yet still believed, like Frederick, that autocracy was the most efficient way to run a state. However, that is way off in the future. We must now discuss the topic at hand, campaigning in the 18th century. See, a lot of warfare in the 1700s was about maneuvering to obtain resources. There were battles throughout the century, but one would be considered an exceptional commander if he could win the campaign without fighting a battle. Battles would often take place when one commander wanted to press the advantage of the resources gained over his opponent. Another reason for a battle would be if an army is losing the campaign operationally and the losing army wants to attack a force uh, decisively in which resources could be captured from the enemy. However, there was one resource that may have trumped all the others in warfare of this age. Even more important than manpower at this time was horsepower. No, I'm not going to go all horse girl on you right now and say how horses are the most majestic and important animal of all time. However, I would like to point out some major uses horses had during this age. Horses were the tanks, scouting planes, and trucks for an army in the 1700s. By that, I mean that horse-bound soldiers, also known as cavalry, were there to do three main things in warfare in the 1700s. A cavalryman had to scout for enemy soldiers to see if one route was clear for them to march into. 
In battle, the cavalry, often the heavy cavalry, called the cuirassiers, would attack at the crucial point of the battle where there was a chance for a breakthrough against enemy lines. After the battle, light cavalry, called the hussars in the Austrian army, would be used as fast-moving tanks are used in modern warfare. Hussars were light men with quick horses that could exploit enemy weaknesses after the battle was won. I will eventually do special episodes about the Prussian and Austrian armies during this war, but let's continue on the horses. See, these quick horses were also used as means of communication. Fast riders also had orders from different commanders, and armies could be easily paralyzed if an unlucky shot killed the rider with the orders from the army. Horses were also used as transport for the equipment and supplies of the 18th century army. These would often be very slow and vulnerable to attack. The baggage train, as it was called then, was one of the reasons the armies moved so slow compared to the armies, uh, later armies, such as Napoleon's Grand Armée. Unlike what many people believe about armies, the determining factor for how big the army is that fights, its speed of deployment, and its quality of weaponry is logistics. An army can fight because of logistics. Logistics is the main reason why Hitler failed in his invasion of the Soviet Union. Logistics is why Putin's army failed to knock out Ukraine in a matter of weeks, as the whole world was expecting. I said this once in this podcast, and I'll say it again. Amateurs talk about tactics while professionals discuss logistics. Another reason why these armies I will be discussing fought in lines is because of the technology at the time, which was determined by, you guessed it, logistics. Logistics is, of course, the complex operation and transportation of people and supplies, in case anyone wanted a definition. But that is why the horse is such an important resource for all of the armies involved in war during the 1700s. This is also a reason why Frederick began the war when he did. Leading up to the war, Frederick wrote, quote, If we wait for Saxony and Bavaria to begin hostilities, we shall not be able to prevent Saxon aggrandizement, and that is utterly contrary to our interests. But if we act now, we shall keep the Saxons down, and by preventing them from acquiring a supply of horses, we shall make it impossible for them to undertake anything. <laughs> Sorry, the mwahaha bit wasn't actually written by Frederick. It just seemed necessary because that quote just seemed like an evil scheme against Saxony. But he was right. Saxony became dependent on the Prussians in the First Silesian War, somewhat because of a lack of horses and poor army logistics. The rest of this episode will be about the road to Molwitz and the battle. So, Frederick was an overall command of the Prussian army with a man who had a lovely name in German that I just have to say. He was General Feldmarschall Kurt Christoph der Graf von Schwerin. What a lovely German sounding name. He will be a main character in our story, so I will hold off from the mini biography for now. Anyway, back to the military campaign. Frederick had a dilemma after he had occupied Silesia. His troops were spread throughout the province, and Frederick had to decide whether he should, where he should deploy his army. Frederick wanted to deploy his army farther north of the border between Silesia and Moravia. He thought that this would give the Prussian army more time to concentrate against an invading force. Whereas Field Marshal Kant von Schwerin wanted to deploy south near the border. Schwerin was thinking that if the Austrians did invade and the Prussian army was deployed in the northern positions, the Austrians could take advantage of important farmlands that could feed the horses. The healthier the horses, the better the cavalry. The better the cavalry, the better the battle will go for you. Thus, due to logistics, the Prussian army was deployed south. However, this left the Prussians thinly spread over a large area. As the Prussian army was done deploying in its winter quarters, Spring finally sprung. In April of 1741, Frederick received the news that the Austrian army led by Field Marshal Count von Neipberg was invading Silesia with 16,000 men. They seemed to be headed toward the Austrian garrison at Brieg. This town was only 42 kilometers 
from the Silesian capital of Breslau. This move by Nightberg was meant to cut Fredegoff from his lines of communication to Berlin. Everyone could smell that it was time for a battle. Frederick wrote to his close friend Charles Etienne Jordan, a Prussian born French Protestant known as a Huguenot. Frederick wrote, quote, My dear Jordan, we're going to fight tomorrow. If heaven prolongs my days, I'll write to you and tell you about our victory. And crucially, he finishes the letter with, quote, Adieu, cher ami. See, in French, you only say adieu when you think you're never going to see the, the person again. I think Frederick had a strange combination of dread and excitement for what lay ahead. It was a cold and misty night as Frederick's army was marching towards the soon-to-be battlefield. There was still snow on the ground as the army was trudging behind the Austrian army to the south of Brieg. The going was extremely slow. According to Robert Asprey's biography of Frederick the Great, the snow was roughly two feet high. If this source is reliable, I don't know, it was from the 1940s. But either way, deployment was slow for Frederick's army. Then, a great stroke of luck happened for the Prussian army. It turns out Field Marshal Neitberg believed that Frederick had deployed his army northeast of Moldwitz, and Frederick had caught him completely by surprise when Neitberg discovered that Frederick was deploying in the complete opposite direction. It was now a race to see who could deploy for battle first, the Prussians or the Austrians. The Prussians were taking their merry time deploying for battle, and the Austrians ended up turning around at the same time the Prussians were ready for battle. Before I begin discussing the battle account, I must first describe the terrain that is before Frederick. The battlefield is in rural Silesia, so there are farmlands interspersed with forests. Overall, the land in front of Frederick was fairly flat. Now to discuss the deployment of the two armies. I will start with Frederick's army because, well, duh, look at the name of the podcast. Starting from right to left, which, if you're looking at a map of the battle on my Instagram, is in the southeast corner of the map with the Prussian army. Right of Frederick's line is the village of Hermsdorf, as the Prussians would initially deploy. On the far right wing of the army was the cavalry, which was commanded by General Johann von der Schunenberg. He previously served for the armies of Saxony and Venice before commanding the Prussian cavalry in this battle. In the Prussian center was the main body of infantry with two main lines. A forward line was commanded by a man named Marwitz, and a reserve line of infantry was led by Leopold Max von Anhalt Dessau. On the far left of the line were two parallel streams known as the Kleinebach, which was the closest to the Prussian infantry lines, and the southern stream known as the Kon Konrad Waldauerbach. Between those two streams, there was cavalry commanded by a man named Rothenberg. If you look at the Prussian formation, it looks very bunched up. There are even soldiers that are deployed at a right angle near the village of Neudorf. Back in those days, the farther your lines were spread out, the more firepower you could bear down upon your enemy. But if the lines were spread too thin, it would leave you vulnerable to cavalry charges. In total, the Prussians had roughly 21,000 men on the field. So that was the Prussian line. Here's how the Austrians were deployed. I will start on their left and go to the right. Northeast of the Austrian line was the small village of Gröningen. Southwest of that village was the elite cavalry of the Austrians led by General Römer. In the center of the lines was the Austrian infantry led by General Goethe. And on the right wing of the Austrian army in the western portion of the map is more Austrian cavalry led by General Berlikingen. In short, think of the two armies like Oreos. The fast-moving cavalry to the left and right of the infantry is like the cookies flanking the cream. Some people think cookies are the most important part of the Oreo. I personally rate the cream higher than the cookie, and I don't care what you cookie lovers say. Anyway, the Austrian army had roughly 19,000 men on the field that day and were led by Field Marshal Neitberg in overall command. The battle began on 1.30 p.m. on April 10th, 1741, with the Austrians turning around from their original deployment, and the cavalry of the Austrian left, led by General Römer, created a scream of six cavalry regiments in front of the Austrian army so the Prussians were deterred from attacking while the Austrians weren't ready. However, 
Cannons began to fire upon the Austrian cavalry in front of the main Austrian army. According to Christopher Duffy's book on the army of Maria Theresa, quote, nothing was more galling to the cavalry than to stand inactive under fire. Therefore, Römer would indulge his restless troops by ordering an attack against the Prussian right flank led by Schulenberg. As the Austrian horses were swiftly charging across the field, the Prussian cavalry did nothing. The Austrians were charging closer and closer, and yet the Prussian cavalry was at a standstill. Then finally, the Austrians crashed on the Prussian right flank, and the Prussian cavalry were getting the worst of it. Here's a quote from the Austrian side about the cavalry engagement at Molwitz. They, meaning the Prussian cavalry, fought at a stand. So they got the worst of every clash. The extraordinary size of their horses did them no good at all. Our cavalrymen always directed their first sword at the head of the enemy horse. The horse fell, throwing its rider to the ground, and he would be attacked from behind. Those poor horses, what happened next, will go down in history as one of Frederick's most defining moments as a commander. Frederick was partaking in the heaviest fighting of the battle in the Prussian right flank, and accounts show that he fought very bravely, but the situation was collapsing around him. The Prussian artillery was firing in the middle of this cavalry engagement, causing many friendly fire casualties. After all, the Prussian and Austrian cavalries both wore white uniforms, the snow made visibility horrible, and they were both shouting in German. With this Utter chaos on the Prussian right, the Prussian cavalry finally broke and rode away from the battlefield. With the battlefield in Austrian control, Field Marshal Schwerin, the second in command, pleaded with Frederick to flee the battle. As that was taking place, the Austrian cavalry began to crash on the right flank of the Prussian infantry lines. Thus, King Frederick would flee the battle in a gray horse that would be nicknamed the Molwitz Grey. Frederick would flee to the city of Oppen, where the Austrians would nearly capture him. But we must go back to the battlefield to see what will become of Prussia's beloved army. Will the Austrians roll up the right flank and defeat Frederick's Silesian adventure? Let's find out. The Prussians on the right flank actually held the Austrian cavalry up and stabilized the line. This was thanks to the years of drill on the parade ground under King Frederick Wilhelm. The Austrian horses were met with a practical fortress of bayonets on the Prussian right. Field Marshal Schwerin, now in command of the entire Prussian force on the field, ordered the infantry in the center to advance toward the Austrian infantry. This is the iconic moment of the battle when the Prussian infantry advanced like moving walls against the enemy. At this point in time, the battle was turning. A Prussian pistol for the, from the cavalry had killed General Römer, the Austrian general that had started the fight and was the most competent Austrian commander in this fight so far. The Prussian infantry slowly approached the Austrian line head on and, fi and finally fired on the Austrian enemy at a short range as the artillery and musket balls were whizzing around their heads. Truly, this was an era full of horrors in this war. Imagine the sounds of the battlefield with the boom of the artillery and the whistling of the musket balls. Some of these reach their target and the man next to you loses his head from the cannonball. Imagine the smell of gunpowder and the stench of dead and dying people all around you. Yet despite all of that, the Prussian infantry kept moving forwards. You can of course understand how shocked you would be as an Austrian recruit in this environment when you see the Prussian army keeping its cool under all of the fire thundering upon them. This caused the Austrian infantry to waver. But one of the determining factors of this battle was that every Prussian soldier was given an iron ramrod, whereas the Austrians still used beech wood, which snapped more easily than metal as it was going into the barrel of the musket. The Prussians could fire three times faster than the Austrians, causing the Austrians to become completely demoralized, and they broke formation and fled the field. Let me read a quote from David Fraser's book on Frederick the Great about the aftermath of the battle. Mr. Fraser writes, 
quote, the Austrian infantry line had been smashed into pieces by superior disciplined firepower and the Austrian cavalry had been disinclined to face it. Losses were even on both sides, but by nightfall, it was clear that the initial Austrian onslaught had achieved only local and temporary effect. The Prussians were masters of the field and Silesia was still in their hands. So the main result of this battle is that it would take more than Nightberg's small army to clear the Prussians out of Silesia. This was a slim victory for Frederick, but a victory nonetheless. As a commander, King Frederick did not perform very well. He botched the deployment of the battlefield and lost the original surprise. But the main reason is that he fled during the battle when it was at its most crucial point. Without Schwerin and the brilliant nerve of the Prussian infantry, the battle would have certainly been a disaster for Frederick. But a win is a win, and he did fight bravely. Frederick would later blame the poor performance in the battle on numbers, despite the fact that the Prussians outnumbered the Austrians and not the other way around. But the legacy of Molwitz would be the beginning of a power shift in Germany. Political and military power would slowly shift from Austria in the south to Prussia in the north, a shift that will become final during the age of Bismarck. But that is way beyond the scope of this podcast. However, with the day of April 10th, 1741, finally over, and the battle done and dusted, I believe I shall have to leave you here. Frederick has finally fought a battle, and despite the poor start, the end was a victorious one. I guess the lesson for today's episode is to never give up. Because this battle was extremely important for the German-speaking world, I will conclude today's episode by saying, tschüss.